Rated M for Mature. Well, we started Telltale because we wanted to make television style video games. We wanted to make things that were really dramatic and full of awesome characters. When we set out to build episodes, we were, it really was for us a lot about, wow, this is a lot like what TV does and we can do cliffhangers and we can keep people engaged over time. Our core mechanic is in the investment in these characters. It's about how to tell a story and let the player take ownership of their part in this story. The Telltale ethos is kind of baked right into the name of the company. They're, they're storytellers. looking for licenses, we always try to start out and think, you know, what's, what's something that we're all fans of? And also, what's something that has a really cool, unique world where we feel like there's a lot of great opportunities for great stories? Uh, we're at a really cool position to be able to point at things that we really dig and say, we want to work on that. We want to do something with that. We've done a lot of comedy, a lot of lightheartedness, and to kind of force our hand to do something that was more adult, more dramatic, was a good direction to challenge us. We had a lot of fans of the Walking Dead comic books in the studio. You know, it just seemed natural to reach out directly to kind of the creative source of this material and, uh, and go from there. As I understand it, Robert, I think, was just uh, pleased and relieved as all storytellers together, you know, the Telltale guys and Robert, I think they were all speaking the same language from, from day one. The thing that's important about The Walking Dead is that, you know, it has heart and it has drama and it's about people surviving in this world and it's about how they deal with the end of the world and how they interact with other people and what that does to a person. Being able to pitch them a brand new character with a brand new story but still keep the themes that he's worked so hard and over so many books to really explore was like a great, great experience. He was really receptive to that. that that's what appealed to me about Telltale. Um, you know, you, you can play Left 4 Dead, you know, you can play Dead Rising, you can play Resident Evil, those are all great games, and right. I do that, and I think other people should do that. But to do a Walking Dead game that's just that would be pointless. I had worries about it when we first pitched it. Any good zombie story is not about killing zombies, it's about the connections with the people. And it took a while for me to wrap my head around how do you make a game out of connections with people. We sort of had that epiphany of, well, if people are playing for the stories, why don't we make the stories as interactive as possible? And that's sort of where the choices came from. You know, we went from a traditional uh, template of adventure, if you will, where it's a point and click, where you exhaust all your options in dialogue before you can actually go on, move on, and do something else. Where you can gather all the information that you want before you make a decision about the kind of strategy that you want to employ going forward. Whereas in The Walking Dead, we basically said, you know what? We're going to let you make one choice. You can talk about this with this person. This is a, a one-time deal. You make a decision and you move on. One of the biggest mechanics that we actually did was timed conversation and timed dialogue. That was actually uh, one of those things where we talked about it and we thought, oh, this might not work. This is probably not going to work, uh, but we'll try it anyway. And we ended up uh, trying it and really, really liking it in the pressure situations. Uh, silence was a, was a really fun challenge because we didn't want the game to stop. In the zombie world, stuff doesn't sit there and wait 10 minutes for you to make a decision. What if my parents come home? It uh, really empowers you to reject the things that we thought. Like when you see three options and you're like, I don't want to say any of that, we give you kind of an escape hatch. I think that the, the concept of intellectual puzzle solving kind of drifting away as, as we've seen in a lot of adventure games uh, and being replaced now by this kind of new emotional puzzle solving because that's what I think of it as is kind of trying to sort your way through moral dilemmas and moral puzzles. It's always been a big part of the Walking Dead universe. Again, the fun is in uh, both in writing and uh, reading and watching those characters is putting them into terrible situations and seeing how they react. The art style of Walking Dead was definitely based heavily on the books. Obviously the books are in black and white, so we tried to take that really graphic, gritty style that the books had. There was talk early on of making an episodic black and white game based on that, um, but the more that we dove into the world and started creating objects and assets, you just kind of start feeling like it's losing something, being a 3D game that's not in color. Our lead artist, Derek Sakai, put in a lot of work to kind of investigate styles that 
know, that felt reminiscent of that comic book style, but really was its own thing and had, uh, you know, maybe brought a little bit more realism and certainly color to the table, but kind of harkened back to, uh, to the original source material. And then you added color to it, it just really popped and it was something that was super exciting that we hadn't really done before. I hadn't seen us do anything like that in the past, but as soon as I started seeing artwork come in, I was blown away by that art style. I, I loved it. I wanted to be off of whatever project I was on at the time so I could get in and work with these, these characters and the environments and it looked like nothing we'd ever produced. As solid as your writing might be and as, as convincing as your animation is and as, as well executed as your cinematography is, if you don't have the voice talent to support where you want to go emotionally, you're just you're not going to be able to get there. So, so we pour a lot of focus into you know appropriate casting and making sure our casting sheets are developed enough that we can express the range that we want to hit. Lee was super, super hard to cast for. We actually had a previous guy in there for a while. And he actually read the entire script. He recorded the entire script. Really staying the course with our initial recording of Lee probably would have been the sensible thing to do. But, uh, but there was a feeling that we could push further. Finding someone that could, you know, not only just take that direction and and create this three-dimensional character with it, but also, you know, be able to do all the really draining emotional stuff that was required of Lee, and then you know the ten thousand lines where you're walking around looking at things and still making it. And it sounds dumb, but like with all the lookats in a room, like little objects you can click on, finding someone who can actually make those sound interesting is a really hard task. We landed on Dave because we had worked with him actually in uh, Law and & Order. And we had, uh, one of our cinematic artists had recommended that we give him a try. Javier Espinosa. <laughs> I will always love him. Like after a, a week of listening to him, you can't imagine anyone else. Been on a lot of games, uh, and this one was just different in every way from the moment I started recording. It said it wanted the character to be very, very real. I would need to be able to go from being very quiet to very loud and angry. This is just a guy who life has kind of fallen apart for him. And his one chance to redeem himself in his own eyes, not for anybody else, in his own eyes, is to take care of Clementine. If Clementine doesn't work, the whole game falls apart. And so that was the, the scariest thing, I think, was casting her. Getting someone who understands the emotional complexities of what's going on with all the characters and being able to also sound like you're a convincing young girl is really tough. We got millions of reads of people doing little kids' voices or they were actual kids who just didn't understand the subtext of any lines they were reading. And it was just, it was a really tough thing to do. We were sent the first round of auditions. Uh, through my agency, all of the female characters called to me because they all had their their own cool personalities or horrible personalities. Um, but Clementine definitely called to me most, playing a kid going through a zombie apocalypse, uh, and and the kid's not you know has to be a strong, put together, independent ish child. You know that just seemed like a, a really uh, cool challenge. It's weird when you're in the recording studio and you're sitting in a chair and you're not looking at her, you're just listening to her record her voices. What should we do now? And you turn your head and look over and you see Melissa there standing and then doing the voice and being into it. That's weird. Well, when I'm talking, yeah, it's like right here. It's all kind of like, instead of like using my chest and my diaphragm. But with Clementine, I can just go there right now. Like her, I think maybe because of all the recording we did, it just, it's stuck. And I think it will be until the day I die. <laughs> the most important uh, relationship is with Clementine, but the second most important relationship is with Kenny, with yeah. this guy that, it's a love-hate relationship. I just approached him like, you know, the man from Cormac McCarthy's The Road. And I just tried to envision that guy maybe five, six months earlier. He was always about, it was about duck. And it's like, if you're not, protecting us, if you're not protecting me and mine, then I'm not gonna like you as much. Underlying in the game, where he'd still be understanding because you'd like, if you help the kids out or something like that, but if you're helping Lily and Larry, then you're wrong. Some of my favorite moments are, you know, these, these conflicts between Lily and Kenny. This isn't your own 
personal dictatorship. See, one of the strengths of the game, I think, is, is, is that we put together, I'm fortunate enough to be able to put together such an amazing uh, voice cast. Uh, it's a great ensemble. So the music was definitely one of those things that, you know, it required a lot of conversation back and forth. And um, Jared Emerson Johnson, who does the music for our games, is super awesome. And, you know, he's really great because you can sit in a room with him and kind of just describe the feel of a certain scene or just the game at large or certain themes you're trying to hit. And he's really good at just internalizing that and going away and coming back with a, a ton of options that are all awesome. In fact, that's usually the problem is that they're all really good. And now you have to choose which one you're gonna go with. Our approach from the very beginning was really thinking, if we don't need music, let's not have it. So if it's a sad scene, let's, well, look at the scene. Is it sad enough? Does it convey everything enough? If it works on its own without any music, leave it, because we, we wanted it to be, you know, as sort of real as possible, and then it was pinpointing those spots where, okay, this could use a little lift, or, you know, this is really scary, we want it to really be shocking. They were very cautious about ever having the music lead the emotion. We always wanted it to be kind of supporting what was already there and never making it bigger the way that, you know, in some, especially in, you know, a lot of film, a lot of really big, uh, epic, dramatic film, you know, the, the music kind of pushes the emotion even further than where it would normally go. And for this, we wanted to just have that ceiling of where the emotion is in the character performances and in the writing and have the music just be right up there with it, but never pushing too far beyond because it starts it can start to get melodramatic that way you know some of these scenes that are really heavy that even as a developer you know and knowing what's coming I kind of struggle to get through dry-eyed I feel like no small part of that is, uh, is from Jared's contribution to the music um, you know both in terms of conveying the mood but also you know being able to subtly establish themes that recur with particular characters and and, and have that that through line throughout Sound is the kind of thing, if you recognize it, if you notice it, you're doing something wrong. And in the Walking Dead game, it's just right. It just helps move the story forward. The crunches, the... the, yeah. the very effective. Very effective. It's yeah. very effective. Like early on, uh, we made a, a lot of uh, impactful uh, gore. <laughs> Axe hits and stuff like that. <laughs> we... Uh, Took a lot of recordings of vegetables uh, being snapped to get enough of this going. We got, I think, basically, basically the entire Telltale office to do the zombie voices. Everybody wanted to be a zombie, so we got them into the studio and we just started recording them. And it's it's not as easy as we thought to kind of get that guttural, um, kind of nasty zombie sound. But yeah, there was about five or ten people that just nailed it. Um, and then we did various things, uh, you know, in post-production, uh, like there's a babysitter zombie. We just kind of wanted to take it to the next level, so we pitched her down just a little bit. And just that little bit of pitch uh, kind of makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Here, working on a game leading up to the last two weeks, like right before we give it to Microsoft and Sony for certification is Pandemonium and Chaos. I'll say there was definitely some nervousness on my part. The last two weeks was really where you saw the emotion come in, the really setup of the really hard choices that we tried to pepper throughout the entire season. It, re it really started coming to life instead of it just being a, you know, a button press through the level or through the scene, it ended up being oh, this is an experience now. We had something that, you know, internally in the studio, we were really pleased with, but when you're so close to something, it's hard to get an accurate sense of how somebody who's less familiar is gonna respond to it. There is one thing that I will forever say about this whole entire, the whole entire Walking Dead team is that they can put a game together um, and they can put it together fast. It was a weird thing to watch The Walking Dead grow up and, and go out into the public. It, uh, we got a lot of response that we weren't expecting. I thought it was a special game. I thought it was a remarkable story. I thought it was risky. And I 
I was genuinely surprised that it went as well as it did, that people received it as well as they did. Stats were a thing that uh, we added a really late. It, it sort of, you know, pulls the curtain away and goes, here, look at all the, you know, look at the machine. And, and I wasn't sure if that was something people wanted and, you know, people did. Once you make a choice, you're very, very curious to know what other people did. And you know, we live in an internet connected age now where people like to go on forums and debate and discuss and talk about what did you do? This is the great genius of interactive storytelling. We don't all experience the same story. We play the same game, the same episode, but we all create our own unique versions of it. Working in a live development environment, we've been able to take what people love about an episode and hate about an episode and address it in the next episode because we're always in a feedback loop. We're always working with the audience and the audience is bringing out the best in us. After seeing the numbers and seeing how they shifted, that, that really made an impact on the way we design things. We want that to be at the 50-50, so let's put the time and effort into making sure that we've built it up enough so that it doesn't go by. People understand what's at stake. People have to pause the game or want to pause the game and say, oh shit, I don't know what to do. I think on episode two, uh, Dennis and I were working on that and we were terrified. We didn't know if episode one had this little secret formula we didn't know about. I was really worried about episode two. It was very divergent and it was very dissimilar to what people had already experienced. And I was worried about whether or not people would be able to still relate to the story and still relate to their, their Lee imprinting on Clementine. You know, you've built up this little group and you're doing your best to survive and, and there's, there's certainly an element of desperation in the second episode where food is scarce and you know, you certainly have no power and we start to deal with issues of trust and this notion that yes, there are other people out there who could help you, but will they? In episode one, the entire internet community was just crying for Larry's blood. He's bitten! We gotta throw him out! I'm gonna kill him, Cat! And so at the time we were making episode two, crap, we have this choice where people get to either help kill Larry or try to prevent Kenny from killing Larry. And at the time I thought, well, the entire internet hates this guy. The stat's gonna be 99% of people killed Larry or helped kill Larry. And, uh, and it was really interesting because then when the game actually came out, it, it ended up being not that at all. And a lot of people tried to help save him. Whoever you align with, you're going to be alienating that other person. You're fucking Free. worthless, Lee. No! <laughs> the end of episode two was originally planned kind of a lot more of like action, suspense, um, tense moment where you're facing off with Andy St. John and eventually you get him on the ground and you're, you know, on top of him just like this one right here. It was more of like a, a catharsis revenge moment. I was working late one night uh, trying to figure out how we we're going to play that sequence and basically was going through all these unused tracks from episode one, um, found the string track. You know, eventually I just booted the game and started playing through the rough pieces we had there and just having that track colored the entire scene in a completely different way. And now you're sitting on top of him, beating his face in and you know, like that, when the string track comes in, it's you know perfectly timed to you know just a couple punches in. So you're thinking like, all right, I'm getting revenge on you, man. And then all of a sudden it, it kicks in. You start thinking like, yeah, okay, man, this is kind of, ugh, jeez, this is sort of depressing. And then cut to Clementine and all the group sort of walking over and standing there judging you for what you're doing. And then we throw control back in your hands and it's like, you can keep punching, man, it's a video game, do it. But a lot of people just kind of stood there in the play test and were like, and then most people just backed out and then got off of him. Let's go. So episode three was definitely our um, Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> it was our like dark middle of the season. You've been in this motor in for several months, you sort of build up this life and all of that gets taken away from you. All of the people you care about get taken away from you. I worked on the Doug Carly death in episode three and it wasn't working, it wasn't working. Things were not feeling good. You know, everybody knew what was gonna happen. And we just had Lily shoot Carly from off screen. What the fuck's the problem? And Eric Parsons, the episode director, he came over to my desk and I showed it to him and he jumped. And I knew we had it, finally. We were gonna have to start killing people off. It's The Walking Dead, you can't keep everyone alive. And we knew that we really wanted to pivot Kenny at that point. At the beginning, he kind of has everything. And in episode three, he loses everything. 
what is going to happen with me? You know, it's like my wife is laying there, you know, my son is laying there. What am I going to do with myself? It was difficult for sure because, you know, again, it was a, that emotional challenge that I'd never really had before. But uh, I loved trying it. It was a lot of fun. It's really important that we did the deaths in such a way that it really meant something to you. We're not trying to manipulate people. That's not the intent. It's definitely to sort of prove to you that in the Walking Dead universe, as is in the comic book universe, nobody is sacred. Nobody is going to come out of this alive just because they're your best friend. Omid and Krista being added to the group late in episode three, you know, you're at this real downer low point in the story. And as a player, you're just like, oh my God, can this get any worse? And in comes Omid with this upbeat, positive attitude, which is there in the writing, but also, you know, from a performance perspective. What's the deal with the train? We're driving it. Oh, man. Uh, Walking Dead episode three had just come out. So I literally just sort of like dusted my hands off and was like, well, I'm gonna go to PAX. And it was my first PAX ever. So it was a big shock to me because PAX is incredible and also because we had a fantastic sort of telltale booth that was, a, you know, for, for the Walking Dead episode three. It was a fantastic weekend. We had so many people lined up. We just had people around the block lined up to play the demo of the, of, of the new episode, just to talk to us, just because they wanted to talk and meet and just share their stories, share their experiences with the Walking Dead, you know, sitting on the couch with their girlfriend or their boyfriend, sitting on the couch with their loved ones, playing this game and what it did to them. There's this family that found us at PAX who played together at game night as a family and they would pause the game and just discuss and argue over what were they going to do next. The panel we did at PAX that year was, um, I had mixed emotions about it because it's always great to get up and, and see the audience in front of you. You know, you often you put these things out into the world and you get reaction, but you don't necessarily see your audience. It was, it was just nerve wracking for me because the, time, the timing of that PAX panel was right after those three episodes that had done so well. We had built, pretty much built episode four at that point, but it wasn't yet shipped. So we had to go up and A, be very you know, cautious about spoilers, but B, it really, again, seeing all the faces of those people out there, people that really were waiting for episode four and five, um, again, I just felt that tremendous sense of responsibility. Well, I didn't want you know, my piece of it to lower the, uh, you know, the, the average. When you're directing uh, an episode, you're sort of given the framework of here's where it fits in, in the season, um, here are the big thing that, things that need to happen. And so we knew how episode four was gonna end, and we knew where episode three ends. So it was sort of a matter of what, what story do we want to tell? And in and, and working with Gary and, and Sean and Jake, we, we spent a long, long time figuring out what it was about. I wanted it to be the episode where you're exploring and you're, and you're un uncovering like a mystery and, it, and, it, and everything sort of in all of our decisions, I was always trying to push exploration. I kind of just wanted it to feel like a Silent Hill episode and it's always about uncovering the next piece. Molly was one of my favorite things about working on episode four. Um, I think you know we decided early on that one of the things the story needed was a Molly-like character. Someone that can come along and really kick some ass for a change. The characters uh, in the Walking Dead universe they are getting their asses kicked so often that we wanted someone that could kind of kick back a little bit. So we knew we knew Ben was gonna die in episode four. People give him shit for sort of being a doofus. He's always messing things up. Ben? Where did you get that? Oh, shit! First time that we presented it to play at a play test, they almost all saved it. And that was, I felt like we had kind of crossed the line of making, a, presenting a choice that was too easy for players. They all wanted to be the good guy. They all, they all wanted to do the honorable thing. So we actually went back and almost completely rewrote Ben in episode four and tried to present him to the player in such a way that we made a better argument for why you might want to drop him. You put that girl in danger again. Won't be walkers you have to worry about. When Lee gets bit, uh, we re really sort of got to turn all your choices around on you and have the group sort of, you know, confront you and <clears throat> and you can either be honest with them or, or conceal the bite. But um, for once, having them make choices instead of the player was really fun. Like I sort of could imagine someone playing as Kenny, like in some alternate universe. So you can end F4 eight different ways, which means you start F5 eight different ways. And then there's different ways to get out of the morgue with and without your arm. And I think there's a couple of different ways that you can actually cut off the arm. The arm chop alone is the best 
It's the best version. It's so good. Uh, Lazar Levine did a great job with the removal of Lee's hand. He had actually recorded Foley with a, uh, a saw and some chicken bones. Bone in, skin on, chicken breast. Uh, the skin had a really uh, rubbery, nasty texture and the little bones snapped when I cut through them. Just mic'd it up in my kitchen, mic'd it up real close. Got this nasty sound. Ah, ah. On top of just all these nasty sound effects, you got this great performance from Dave Fenoy, just screaming his guts out. Ah, ah. It's a horrible scene. I believe the way that, you know, how Kenny, whatever happens to Kenny, I, I liked the way that it ended up playing out because it was an opportunity for him to just be like, you know, all the bad that we had, you know, either between Lee, all the bad with Ben, it's like, none of it matters. You guys just get out of here. Because it just, you know, it made Kenny seem like more of a badass, you know, which was, we always want. So it was fun to, you know, to have it resolved that way. Kenny, please! Well, I think we knew pretty early on that we wanted to tell this complete story of Lee's redemption and him doing his best to prepare Clementine in these, you know, less than imperfect circumstances. It started at the place where, where he was a flawed character who, who had done some bad things and, had, and still had to answer for that. And that answer was to, to be a better person to Clementine at any cost. When Sean Vanneman said, oh, by the way, <laughs> yeah. you're going to die in episode five. And my initial reaction was not great. But by the time we got to episode five, uh, one, I had reconciled myself to it, and uh, after the fact, it gave me a great opportunity as an actor to go to some places that uh, very few actors in a game ever get to go to. I would play that scene over and over again because I would help test and sort of check the bugs, and every single time it was difficult. It was one of those scenes where you'd see someone walking around, moving around, and they'd be like, you gotta go play, you gotta go play the end of the game. I was gonna do the typical acting thing, and uh, just, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna put on my sad voice yeah, and, and sad action. face and, and action. Uh, but what I discovered was I actually ended up crying, that I mm -hmm. actually had these emotions. I went in and I was bummed out. I mean, I knew it was coming. The tears were, you know, it was pretty instant. to the telltale people, the, the cinematic artists and designers and editors and everybody else was kind of gathered over at uh, Venice and Art's house. He said, everybody come over to my apartment tonight, we're going to watch the VGAs uh, and we'll drink to commiserate when we lose. And we were happy to, to hear our names, to hear people say, and up for nomination is The Walking Dead. It's not the typical game you see getting that kind of recognition. You feel a bit like you're in the company of giants. I don't think anybody expected us to win but we were all still secretly hoping that we would. We knew we had a chance. And the VGA Tech Game of the Year goes to the Walking It's so, so, so surprising. I couldn't talk. The Walking Dead fans, this is obviously for you. Thank you so much. Just want to thank everyone at the studio. Thank you so much to the people we work with. Holy cow. I'll never forget it. It was, it was an amazing experience. When we sat down to talk about 400 days, uh, it wasn't even 400 days at the time, it was just DLC. You know, we knew we were going to do an extra episode. We wanted to have something that people could play while they were waiting for season two, but we didn't want it to be the same thing as season one. 
So we sat down and we talked a lot about what that meant. And then we came up with this idea of it being an anthology story, which is about not just one character, but five. We didn't want to trample on their, the, the story that we had already told. We wanted to do something fresh and new and tell a story of a place. Um, so somebody pitched the idea of having multiple people going through the same scene and it impacting different playthroughs. These are small vignettes that are putting you in a specific situation and just handing it to you and saying, what do you do? We really wanted it to have a reason to exist. We didn't want to just have it a little extra bit of Walking Dead, like oh, it was a little extra snippet, you know. Even if you have nothing to do with the rest of the season, it's still a really interesting thing. And we wanted to try an experiment, try different ways of making a story. You know, Telltale's always trying to change the way that it makes stories and try new things and experiment. Let's mop them. Obviously, things haven't gotten better in the world of zombies and humans. humans. I think what was so great about season one was that people wanted to take care of this kid. They loved Clementine, they, they wanted to take care of her. And now the tables have turned and she's gonna be the one that you play. I guess initially I was like, well, people react to that. Maybe they would still want someone to step into Lee's shoes, and which you can't ever. Never. But like I said, after reading the script and going into record, it just felt so right. Playing as a grown man and playing as a preteen girl, they have way different fighting styles. Clementine is very evasive. She's very trying to scramble out of anyone's way. Like zombies grabbing her, she scrambles out of the way. Uses the environment a lot more instead of brawn. She's no Michonne, you know? <laughs> she's, not, she's not there, and, and I think that's gonna be the essence of, of why people love her character, is because she still is Clementine, and she's, there's an innocence, and maybe even a slight glimmer of hope that still lives in, within her. It's posing some challenges, but it's also very cool because it's very different. We learned a lot through 400 Days, and we learned a lot through all of season one. We're going to take what we learned there and just amp it up for season two. We've heard a lot of people say, you know, you're going to play Clem in season two. You better not hurt her. She's in Robert Kirkman's zombie world. The player is pretty much the only thing she has going for her at this point. I want to see what happens with Clementine. It's the Lee in me that still wants to protect Clementine and, and you know, is, is rooting for her. I think she's going to do you proud. <laughs> all right, all right. That's what I want to hear. I think, you know, my job in terms of kind of keeping the team moving in the right direction and, and, uh, and keeping that progress going and, and delivering something excellent, to have the fans out there kind of helping to fuel that effort is something I really appreciate, particularly through to the later episodes where things are getting hard and you know, you're putting in long hours and you know, you're really asking a lot of the team, I think to have that positivity out there uh, to help push people through that was, was definitely a plus. Thank you for making this game what it was, because the, the fans' response to it and the fans' feedback shaped what it was going forward, and we wouldn't have made this game what it was without that feedback. So thank you for buying it, thank you for responding to it, and also, I'm, I'm sorry if I made you cry. <laughs> Thanks for making this game successful and letting us make more, because that's we get attached to these characters too, and so and, you know, internally I think we spend so much time with them that we really hope that everyone else will like them too. And it's nice when they do, and then we can just continue telling more stories with those characters, so best. It's incredible. I never would have expected it. Like the Tumblrs and the Twitter accounts and the, the people posting on our forums and just everywhere. Um, I, I've never seen anything like it. I love going and watching people play live streams of a game with their friends and seeing the reactions when the, the characters that they like get killed off. 
like this is cool. This is exactly what we always hoped would happen. You know, it's just people getting together and kind of like one enjoying the game, but two just being so passionate about it that they're like really going to bat for like the choices they made. These ones were always the most tragic. When they, when when you see people always want to draw the characters being happy. Have you noticed that? Because they get so little of it in the game that they feel like they need to kind of project this kind of myth mythical happy life onto these characters. You know, it's funny how much people love Ben. It seems like a lot of people don't like Ben in the game, but there's so much fan art. I wouldn't be surprised if, if you did all the numbers, you would, you, would, you would see that Clementine is probably the most drawn character. I think by the end you realize it was really Clem's story all along.